You know, as we were singing those two songs and reflecting on heaven, you know, it occurred to me that everything that is special and that we love about this setting right now is simply teaching us small lessons about what heaven will be, about being able to sing uninhibited by the limitations of our voices or of our musical ear, but singing to God and with him being present there in a way that's perhaps even different for us than he is here now. And to think about doing that in the presence of a different kind of assembly than what we have here now. And as we were singing those songs, part of the sentiment that came to my mind was how special it is to sing those songs with all of you. What a special thing to sing songs about heaven with the people that are here in this building right now in this room with the shepherds that we have and with their good wives, with the men who serve this church in a special way and their families, with my own physical family here, a lot of them, good friends, with all of you. But you also kind of start thinking in that day and time where the soul never dies, there'll be many more people. Can you imagine an assembly in which grandparents and parents or maybe children who aren't here with us anymore will blend their voices with ours. Good men, preachers, elders, maybe those that you remember from your youth that had such an impact on you. Can you imagine the room full of them all back together again where the soul never dies? And no more in remembrance of me. There's no need of a remembrance. There he is the Son, the Lamb, and that's for all eternity. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, everyone, for, for the worship and helping us all long for that day. And that's why worship is so meaningful for us, because it puts in perspective the little storms we have to face in life, the challenges, even the days of joy, puts it all in perspective, and I drive toward one goal. And there will come a day in which even those things will be rendered beautiful. Hard as I might think it, hard as that might be to believe it, all of those things will be rendered beautiful in their own time when I'm there to glorify the one who deserves it. For all who are here tonight, especially visitors, we welcome you. And we welcome you to the family of God to worship him and now to reflect on some precepts from his word that can help us get to heaven. I want us to think about a story from the Word of God this evening. I want to go ahead and say from the very outset, to whom does this lesson apply? Very immediately to preachers, to teachers, Bible class teachers, whether you're standing up in front of here or whether you're in the baby's class, the children's classes, or anyone who anticipates ever having a spiritual conversation with someone who might need to hear some truths that might be difficult truths. These are the people to whom this lesson applies. I want us to think about a story going back in the Old Testament era, and it begins with King Ahab. Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who have become proverbial for wickedness. As the scriptures teach, because of Ahab's idolatry, and because he absolutely forsook the ways of the Lord and broke the covenant with the Lord, there was no one who sold himself to do wickedly before Lord, the Lord, no one before Ahab. And the worst thing that he did was take his wife Jezebel to be his wife and to be his counselor in evil. During the time of Ahab, there was another king in Judah by the name of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was almost the opposite of Ahab. And that he walked in the ways of his good father Asa, pursuing the way of the Lord. He had removed some of the idolaters' cults from the land. And Jehoshaphat was a good and was a strong king. It so happened that during the reigns of these two kings, that Ahab and the Israelites had lost a strategically important city by the name of Ramoth Gilead. Now, if you're picturing the land of Palestine, and you've got the Jordan River... Ramoth Gilead would be on the east side of the Jordan River. Now, what do we remember about the city of Ramoth Gilead? 
It was one of the cities of refuge. And that meant also it was a city that was especially given to Levites. But it also lay along extremely strategic trade route that went from Egypt and connected northern Africa and the Arabian Peninsula with the rest of the northern Levant. A very important city on this important trade route. The Israelites had lost it to the Syrians and Ahab wanted it back. And so he invited King Jehoshaphat from Judah to come up and spend time with him. Now, for students of the Bible, this is a mystery that will always puzzle us. Why would Jehoshaphat be such friends with Ahab? That, that blows my mind, but he was. And so Jehoshaphat accepted the invitation of Ahab. And so Jehoshaphat goes north, and he is there with King Ahab, and they set out thrones in front of the city of Samaria, and they hold court, though, there, these two kings. And Ahab has sacrifices made in honor of Jehoshaphat's arrival. And as Jehoshaphat now arrives, and he's sitting there on his throne with Ahab, Ahab pronounces among all of his court and all of his subjects, what are we doing? Is not Ramoth Gilead ours? Why don't we go and take back that city that belongs to us? Now, it would not have disturbed uh, Ahab, that oh, this is a city of Levites. This was a city of refuge. He would not have been concerned with such trivial things. He was concerned about it being a strategic city for commercial and military reasons. He said, is not Ramoth Gilead ours? Let's go and take it. He says, Jehoshaphat, will you go with me and help me retake Ramoth Gilead? Jehoph Jehoshaphat said, I will be with you. My people will be as your people, and my horses will be as your horses. My forces will be as yours. And so Jehoshaphat said, but before we go, can we not inquire of Jehovah, of the Lord, and see whether or not he would approve of this? And so Ahab brought in 400 prophets, but false prophets, and they began to announce before these two kings, thus says the Lord, Go up to Ramoth Gilead, and the Lord will deliver it into your hand. And as Jehoshaphat is observing this, he receives this word from the false prophets, and he says to Ahab, Is there not a real prophet of the Lord that we can inquire of here? And Ahab said, Well, there's one man, but I can't stand him, because he never says anything positive about me. Well, Ahab, shouldn't that make you think about some things? But no, he never says anything positive about me. He's Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, don't let the king say such things. Let's call him in and inquire of the Lord from him. So Ahab gave the word, go and fetch Micaiah, the son of Imlah. In the meantime, these false prophets are parading themselves before Ahab. And there's one of them named Zedekiah who has fashioned horns of bronze. And perhaps this is a gesture uh, to Ahab and Jezebel's favorite god, Baal, uh, kind of a bull fertility god. But he brandished these horns and he said, Thus says Jehovah, with these horns you will gore the Syrians and drive them to obliteration. And all the prophets with one voice said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and you will prosper. In the meantime, there's a servant who goes and he fetches Micaiah. He tells Micaiah the king's message and the summons. And he tells Micaiah, now look, one time, tell the king what he wants to hear. All the prophets with one voice are saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. One time, can you not say what the king needs you to say? Micaiah replied, as the Lord lives... Whatever my God says to me, that I shall speak. So Micaiah then is presented before Ahab and Jehoshaphat. And Ahab questions him, Micaiah, shall we go up to Ramoth Gilead or not? Micaiah replied, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. The Lord will deliver it into your hand. Being very sarcastic and and serving as a criticism for these false prophets. Ahab said, did I not tell you that he would, would not say good things about me? I, I put you under oath. Tell me what the Lord has to say. So Micaiah said, 
the Lord showed me. And I saw the armies of Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord made a proclamation. Israel, everyone return to your homes in peace. So he said, Ahab, the Lord has decreed disaster for you. Ahab turned to Jehoshaphat and said, I told you, he never tells me anything but evil. Micaiah spoke up and he said, I want to tell you something else the Lord showed me. The Lord showed me his throne. And he was sitting on the throne. And all the hosts of heaven were on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord spoke and he said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up to Ramoth Gilead and fall? And one spirit said this, and one spirit said that. But finally, one spirit came up in front of the throne and said, I will persuade him. In what way? I will go and I will be a lying spirit in the mouths of all of his prophets. The Lord said, you will succeed and prevail over him. Go. Micaiah then said, Ahab, beware. The mouths of your prophets have a lying spirit in them and they are lying. And this is the decree of the Lord. So at this point, one of those false prophets, Zedekiah, remember with the guy with the iron horns? He walked over to Micaiah and gave him a blow in the face and he said, why don't you tell me which way the spirit went from me to you just then? And Micaiah said, the day that you're running for your life and hiding in your closet, you'll know. Ahab put a stop to this and he said, seize him and take him to the governor and to the king's son and tell them, put this man in prison and feed him only on crumbs and waters until I come back in peace. Micaiah said, if you ever come back in peace, the Lord has not spoken to me. All you people, listen, take heed and beware. And he was let out. Now, if you're Jehoshaphat, why would you go? Why would you go on? But he did. And to compound things, Ahab told Jehoshaphat, now look, here's going to be our strategy. When we go into battle, I'm going to put on common soldier's garb. And I won't, it won't be evident that I'm the king. But you keep on your royal raiment and your royal regalia. And you will be as the acting king in battle. And Jehoshaphat agrees to this. And as they begin the battle, unknown to Jehoshaphat, the king of Syria had told his men, all 32 of his chariot divisions... He told those commanders, don't spend time anywhere in the battle, but drive at the king of Israel. Find the king of Israel and take him out. Focus on no one else. And so when the battle began, immediately the strongest contingents of the enemy drove straight at Jehoshaphat. And he cried out to the Lord to save him and the Lord diverted them away from Jehoshaphat and spared him. During the midst of the battle... A Syrian archer just drew his bow at random and fired into the host of the Israelites and he struck Ahab in the joint of his armor in his chest. And Ahab said to his chariot driver, wheel us out, I've been hit. And through the rest of that afternoon as the battle raged on and as the Syrians were winning the upper hand, Ahab lay dying in the back of the, the, uh, the army and around sunset, he died. And once the Israelites realized their king was dead and the battle was lost, they signaled retreat and they withdrew. And as they were rinsing and sloshing out the blood from the chariot, dogs were licking up the blood of Ahab. When Jehoshaphat returns to Judah, a prophet of the Lord meets him, Jehu, the son of Hanani. And Jehu said to Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? The wrath of God is upon you. Nevertheless, he has seen good things in you, in that you have removed some of the idolatrous cults from the land, and you have prepared your heart to seek God. And as a result of that rebuke and somewhat encouragement, Jehoshaphat then proceeded to further restore the spiritual state of the nation. 
and we won't talk about it this evening, but when Jehoshaphat's nation faced an existential crisis by an invasion of a coalition of other peoples, Jehoshaphat depended upon the Lord and was saved in that day. What lessons now do we gain from the story of Micaiah, the son of Imlah, and from the boldness of Micaiah? I'd like to submit to you, there are four lessons that we need to learn from this story. And I'd like to go back and think about those principles and applications we learn from the story of Micaiah. One of the lessons that this story impresses upon me is the fact that, number one, there always has been and there always will be a market for the false teacher. As long as humanity lives, there will be the false teachers who have some business. We see that in the days of Micaiah, there were the false prophets that would tell the king what they wanted him to hear. And it didn't matter that it wasn't what the Lord had to say. It is always the case that teaching or saying things on behalf of God for financial benefit or for social advancement or for a desire for prominence among a community, these will always be the motives that contaminate some who claim to speak on behalf of God. And it wasn't only in the days of Micaiah. Let's turn over in our Bibles to the book of Micah. Let's turn over to the prophet Micah to chapter 3. And here, Micah, the true prophet of God, is warning about the false prophets who were still alive in his day. Look over in Micah chapter 3. As we read through here, I want you to think about our day and time and compare it to that and see how little has changed. Micah chapter 3. If you look in verse 5, the prophet says, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but who prepare war against him, who puts nothing into their mouths. What a vivid description of the false prophet. As long as someone is feeding them, as long as someone is giving them some kind of financial compensation, you know what the message is for that person? Peace. You're doing great. God's in favor with you. You're doing great. But to the person who does not feed their selfish desires and lusts, war upon you, criticism for you. And look at what Micah goes on to say in verse 6. As a result, therefore, you prophets shall have night without vision and you shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. Here, the true prophet of God contrasts himself with the false prophets, and the motivation for why they were teaching. It is always the case That if we're standing up here to address the people of God, not just in a sermon, but if you're giving a talk for the Lord's Supper, if you are teaching a class, if you are in the classrooms in the back, if you're sitting across a kitchen table or in a keyboard communicating with someone on the will of God, you have to stop and ask, am I going to be in the ranks of the false prophet who tells someone what they want to hear? Or am I I going to teach for the approval of others or for of God? As Paul asked the question in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, for do I now seek to please others? For if I sought to win the approval of men, I would not be a servant of the Lord. And as we read just a few minutes ago in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul warned Timothy, preach the word and be consistent in it because the time will come when there won't be consistency, but they will heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears. What motivates anyone who speaks on spiritual matters should be a desire to please God. As the apostle wrote to Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. Am I saying this to please others? For my own selfish ambitions? Or am I doing it to be a true 
teacher of God's word. There's a second lesson I'd like for us to gain from the story of Micaiah. And that is that great damage is done by false teaching. Because it prevents the listener from making needed corrections. You know, certainly there was present in the day of Ahab and Jehoshaphat, there was the single voice, but there was also the loud voice of the false prophets. And they did great harm to Ahab in that they were directing him and leading him astray. Connected to the point we just made, telling someone just what they want to hear for my own selfish reasons, endangers the soul of both speaker and listener. Let's turn over to Jeremiah chapter 23. On this point, the prophet Jeremiah says very important things for us to listen about the damage done by the false teacher and how I must avoid that. Look in Jeremiah chapter 23. It'll start in verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to those who despise me, The Lord has said, You shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, no evil shall come upon you. So what's the result of that? If God is observing people and he sees them in sin, and there are prophets who are speaking as if it were from the Lord, and they're saying, oh, you're okay. God's grace is for you. God's favor is for you. What is the result then? Look on to verse 21. The Lord says, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. You can see here the sadness and the regret in God's voice as he said, even if some of these prophets would have told the people the truth, some of them would have listened and they would have turned. And they would have been healed then from their evil. God goes on to say then, this is the saving result of my word being applied. In verse 23. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying... I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor, as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. God's design is for, his, for his word is that it be a fire that purifies and separates. It's to be a hammer that breaks up the hard and stubborn heart. And when I am face to face with someone, and I withhold from them some of God's truth, or I inject something in it to water down God's truth. I am nullifying the design of God to save souls. If there is someone I'm talking to, and for example, they're in a marriage that they have no right to be in, and I make them feel okay in that, I am nullifying and watering down the word of God. I am a false prophet. If there is someone who asks me about the conditions of salvation... And whether or not, for example, if I just believe or accept Christ, am I going to be saved? Oh, well, let's let God judge that. And I don't tell them the truth about it. I'm one of the false prophets. And I'm saying these things, ultimately, even though I might think I'm being merciful or patient or gentle, I am actually contributing to the death of a soul. I'm really saying those things for my own selfish benefit, because I don't want to be a bad guy. We have to be aware of the great damage done when we withhold the saving, purifying truth from others. I must 
learn from Micaiah, and cultivate the disposition that I will tell someone what they need to hear, not just what they want to hear, so that their soul may be saved. Could you imagine going to your dermatologist, and he looks at a spot on your arm, does a biopsy, sends it off to a lab, you come back in a week, and can you imagine the kind of doctor who would say, as he's about to go into that room, you know, this is cancer. It looks nasty. The biopsy has come back, and it's very conclusive and decisive on this. But this is a really nice guy. I really like him, and you know, he's had some problems at home, some problems at work. He's going through a rough spot. This is just not the time to tell him about this skin cancer. So let's just kind of punt the ball down for a few months. I'll just tell him, you know, come in in half a year, and we'll check up on, on you then. And maybe the circumstances in his life will be such that I'll tell him the truth then. If you knew your doctor were doing that to you, how would you feel about that? Do you want them treating you that way? I want people to tell me the truth. I may not like it. And I may not have the best of attitudes. Now, do I want to be like that? Sometimes we are human. And we don't always have the best attitudes. Sometimes I'm talking with someone and I know their personality. And I know how they're going to react. But there comes a point when I need to realize I am dealing in matters of spirituality with things much more important and graver and of eternal consequence than even the physical body. This is literally spiritual life or death. Now there are some people that by their disposition and their character, they're as blunt as could be. All right, They will tell you like it is, that's just how they are. They'll tell it like it is in politics and sports and in food. How do I look in this clothing, whatever? They'll tell you the truth. And sometimes that characteristic is they're just not really conscious of or empathetic with the thoughts of others. Some of us are more like that than others. If we tell the truth of the gospel, and that's the only reason we're telling the truth, we need to rethink our motives. But if we are the sort of person who is always thinking, now how are they going to react to me? How do they like me? How are they thinking about me? If we're people pleasers... That's fine. We need people like that around to kind of balance things off. You especially need to be careful about how you handle holy writ and how you are discussing matters of truth with others. There comes a point when I need to set aside some of these other considerations and tell the truth. Now, does that require all the tact that I have, all the gentleness and all of the understanding and wisdom that I can possess? Certainly. There have been a lot of people that thought that telling the truth meant I rub people the wrong way and I frustrate people and I'm ugly about it. Now that's not boldness, that's just being ugly. But what it comes down to is I have to realize great damage is done if I don't tell people the truth. There's a third lesson we get from the story of Micaiah. When that servant or messenger was bringing Micaiah to the king and he said... Why don't you just for one time tell the king what he needs to hear and wants to hear? Remember Micaiah's message? Whatever my God says to me, that I will speak. We learn from Micaiah that when it comes to matters of spiritual things, when it comes to matters of the Lord's church, salvation, morality, how I conduct myself, final judgment, the message is not mine. It belongs to the Lord. We all have opinions, we all have preferences, we all have ways of seeing the world. But what it comes down to it is, if I'm speaking on spiritual things, I set that aside. And I help people understand truly what the Lord has to say. When in an assembly of God's people, addressing someone privately, whenever souls are at stake, it is God's word and his message which must be taught. If anyone speaks... Let him speak as the oracles or the sayings of God. When Paul went among the Corinthians, as he later would write to them, he said, when I came in among you, I determined that I would not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, 
so that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The false prophet is constantly consumed with what is the wisdom of men? What do I think would be the politically advantageous or the socially advantageous thing to say? The servant of God knows no such thing. It is what is God's message? And that means there are some things that I simply don't bring up and don't don't talk about because they're not the message of God. Matters of history or of philosophy or of sociology or some of these things and other private conversations that might be appropriate, but when it comes to a matter of the soul and addressing spiritual conditions, those things are irrelevant. What does the will of God have to say? The content of the message is God's and it's not mine. Fourthly, and related to that, all of God's will must be taught. After Micaiah went ahead and told Ahab, I saw the vision the Lord gave me, Israel scattered, and the Lord said, let everyone return to his own place. Micaiah went on to tell, this is what's going on behind the scenes, so beware Ahab, these all are liars, and they're trying to deceive you. The Lord is presenting this before you so you can make your decision. All of God's will must be taught. Micaiah fully declared God's will. And from that, I want to pair with that a passage from the book of Acts. If you'll turn with me to chapter 20. This is the same spirit with which Paul spoke of his work among God's people. In Acts chapter 20, as he's telling the elders from Ephesus... And is reminding them of his work among them. And containing instructions on the attitudes with which they should carry on their work of shepherding. As he says in chapter 20. Look at what Paul says in verse 20. He says, I kept back nothing that was helpful. But proclaimed it to you. And taught you publicly and from house to house. Paul says, I kept back nothing that was profitable for you. And again, look over to verse 26. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. What does that mean practically for this church? It means that you should be in the business not just of tolerating or passively accepting preaching or teaching. You are in the business of demanding that the whole counsel of God and all of its soundness and truth be declared. That means that there will be lessons that will lift us up, that should encourage us, from the kinds of encouragement God has given us, from the inspirational stories of godly men and women who serve the Lord against great odds, and from the teaching of the Lord and the apostles about the hope of heaven and the confidence of salvation and God's presence among us to strengthen us, You should expect and demand and call for those things. But it's also the case that there are lessons that sometimes aren't going to make us feel just great inside. There are some times in which we hear things and it feels very uncomfortable. It's not pleasant. And we might walk away thinking, I've not been what I ought to be. Or might walk away thinking, that hurts. That was unpleasant. But if it is true... If it is from the portion of God's word as God intended that message to be delivered, we need it. It reminds me of something that a more experienced preacher said one time that I remember and kind of tucked away. He said there there are three kinds of congregations. There are some congregations that will not tolerate sound doctrine. They only want the good. They don't want to hear the kind of teaching that should purify us and challenge us. And motivate us to better service. They, don't, they will, not, will not tolerate it. Some matters of salvation. Or some matters about the home and marriage and divorce. Or some matters about the end times. Or some matters about the organization of the church. There are some churches that say, don't talk about that. Now they may not articulate it in that way. But there are other kinds of pressures than just direct messages given. There are cold shoulders. There are other kinds of pressure. There are some churches that they won't tolerate sound doctrine. There are some churches, secondly, who will tolerate sound doctrine. 
If they hear a lesson, even if it's a hard one, even if it's challenging, they will appreciate the effort of a feeble man getting up here to do his best to explain the will of God as we all need it from time to time. And they will appreciate that and they will tolerate that. But there's a third kind of congregation. And that is the one that doesn't just tolerate sound teaching, they demand it. And that's what we want to be. Whether it's an audience here as an assembly or whether it's in any capacity in which I am hearing the word of God, I say, I want to hear it all. I dare not go through life ignoring a portion of Scripture or some of what God said about anything. I want to hear it all, the good, the bad, the positive, the negative. I need to hear that. And so what we are trying to talk about is learning from Micaiah, And learning that, no, not every lesson should be, you're not this, you're not that, you're falling short here, you got to do better. But those have to come sometimes. We all need that. We all need to be told these things sometimes. Scripture is designed for that purifying purpose. We also need the lessons of, you're doing well. Keep at it. You're abounding in this. Keep it up. Think about this as well. It reminds me of what Jehu said to Jehoshaphat. He said, in this regard, why are you helping those who are wicked and love those who hate the Lord? But he said, you're also doing this well. Stop this, and the Lord is with you in this. That is the kind of preaching, the kind of teaching, and from time to time, the conversations that we have to have. What it comes down to is God's people want God's message, whatever it is. You know, as I reflect on these four points, beware there's always a market for the false teacher. The damage done by false teaching, it's God's message, not mine. And it must be all of God's message. What this reminds me of is when you look at the end of the story of Micaiah, he wasn't listened to. He was ignored. But you know the thing about that is, I hear Micaiah. I hear him loud and clear. And I don't want to ignore him. There are results of God's word being applied that don't always exhibit outward signs of success. Puts me in mind of what the prophet Isaiah said. In Isaiah chapter 55. He said, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and water the earth, So that it may bring forth in bud and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please. And it will succeed in the thing for which I sent it. I have to believe that that's true. And I have to act and live and teach and study like that's true. God will give his word success. It will achieve the results that he intends. It may be the water that erodes, or it may be water that causes growth. The heart's mind to decide. But God's word will accomplish that which he pleases. And I need to leave the results to God and trust him. Because it's his work, his field, his building, and his souls. They're not mine. You know, when I was a younger preacher trying to learn, I was told, maybe not as an exact quotation, but, you know, you've heard a lot of good gospel preachers in your time. You've heard preachers who've done meetings and written things and been in lectureships and all that. You've heard some good ones. They're not your models. Go to Moses, Samuel, Elijah, John the Baptizer. They're your models. And they all demonstrate traits that are brought to perfection in Jesus Christ. What I've been trying to say is that if you read 1 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 18, you will see in Micaiah the son of Imlah the model of what it looks like to speak the word of God and the sayings of God. And that's something that is spiritually healthy for both speakers and audiences, 
because we're all one of the either uh, one of either one from time to time. Thank you for listening this evening, and I commend the lesson to you. At this time, if you would go ahead and prepare to sing our song of invitation. And what we call upon you to do is that if in the past days, maybe in the past hours or minutes, you've been considering your soul and you realize that you need to make some changes in your life, if you realize that you need to come to the Lord and to become his child, become a disciple, do it on God's terms and meet him on his terms. If you will believe in the gospel and on the son of of heaven that he sent for us, if you will believe him and will turn from your sins and be immersed in water, God says you will be saved. And if there's any way that we can help you and assist you in that, we invite you. If there's anything that we can do as a congregation to bring you closer to God, make it known while we stand and sing our song.